that Leviza will uh, first give you an overview of Fancast history and extreme application. And then we will really go uh, to the core of the, of the webinar. Uh, Thomas Flynn will start with an overview of different systems. And uh, Bernd Geiser will uh, do a focus on HLS. So we will cover a, a different and a technical aspect of audio transmission. And in between, Tobias Dornbusch, our product expert, will do a, a short uh, extreme demo. So I will give the floor now to Detlef Wiese for the introduction. Thank you, Virginie. Yeah, just a brief introduction to Fancast history and, and welcome to uh, everybody here, lots of international participants, very glad to uh, see the, the list of um, people coming to our webinar. Um, very much in brief, because you're here, I think, for the main topic, so don't want to bother you too long with history and objectives. So we started end of 2018, Fancast, and um, we're very lucky to have um, already public broadcasters at the very beginning joining us as customers. Uh, let me take Deutschland Radio as one big example. Um, we learned a lot um, to develop our software for 24-7 applications. The main objective actually we uh, defined end of 2018 to say 24-7 all your applications for, well, let's say almost any case, uh, a variety of applications as soon as they are live. So we're very happy uh, to establish a team of almost uh, 10 people in Aachen and, uh, and Munich. And, um, were able to to grow um, and also until now let's say um, have a reasonable footprint in the market with our uh, extreme uh, software i give you a bit of application examples in the next um, slide so you can see where we are uh, positioned so there is uh, definitely all the, the back end for uh, online radio streaming it's a very scalable solution from one to more than 100 programs, very, very flexible with lots of formats. Um, it's also supporting DVB multiplexing, um, similarly scalable with uh, lots of additional functions and features. Uh, we process files uh, and do podcast creation in a very nice, automized uh, way for medium and bigger public broadcasters. Um, also, the, the software is applicable to studio transmitter links, so it's um, very perfectly uh, suitable for all type of links uh, and bringing audio to the transmitters. And on the next slide, there are a few more. Uh, SIP communication, um, very important part, whether it's really the communication itself, following all the different uh, standards and the variety of uh, requirements, but also as an machine and also supporting uh, SIP uh, services. Uh, all things I'm mentioning are in place at customer sites. And uh, today, I think we focus on a very interesting topic, the reliable audio transmission. And um, yeah, with that, I would like to give um, the word back to Virginie. Thanks, Betlef. Um, now, Thomas Shin is going to give you an overview of uh, all uh, transmission system with a focus on contribution and distribution uh, formats overview. I will uh, give you the screen, uh, Thomas. So uh, welcome to our talk about reliable transmission for audio contribution and distribution. So my name is Thomas Schlien and I will start in my part for giving you an overview of uh, different formats and standards and my colleague Bernd Geiser will focus in the next part of the presentation on HLS, which is a, a distribution format you will later see. So um, I will start with a system overview and then going into detail for some contribution formats and distribution formats. And at the end, I want to give you some example scenarios for reliable transmission. So here we have an overview of the of old system, so you have a reporter which is actually reporting to radio studio and this contributes to an so called encoder it's a machine that's uh, getting all the uh, audio inputs, for example, via analog audio or RTP. Uh, AES uh, 67 SRT RTMP RIST and zip and uh, now it's all these short. <laughs> words, but uh, I will go into detail on the next slide there. 
And then it's distributed from the encoder to a CDN, so a content delivery network, which actually uh, gets the audio data via different formats like Icecast, Vibrid, HLS, and Dash, and so on, and then distributes that to the listener. So I want to start with some contribution formats um, and start with RTP, which is actually uh, the real-time transport protocol. This transports uh, raw audio, for example, in the case of AES67 or compressed audio in real time. It's based on the very basic uh, IP protocol UDP, which is actually just a bare header for having in included the IP address, but not much more. And so um, the RTP protocol actually adds a sequence counter and a time counter. And so a packet loss can be detected. So it has no real protection against packet loss, except if the codec that's used inside, for example, like the Opus codec actually supports forward error correction, then it would also be a more reliable um, transmission. Uh, to get more reliable, you can also do something like network bonding or so that you actually uh, transfer these RTP stream over two cables to uh, via two different locations. And then you have a, a more reliable transport. Um, actually, RTP can be um, adjusted to very small packets. For example, for AS67, you have one milliseconds packets. And so you can have a very low delay in that format. But you have to be um, careful because then you get some more overlay, uh, overhead, overhead. So more data for less audio. So, and uh, another contribution uh, protocol is RTMP. That's actually IP TCP based, which has some packet repetition uh, mechanism inside. So it's a little bit more reliable, but it's proprietary or was proprietary at least, and was um, specified in 2009 by Adobe, but it's more or less outdated today. It's, it's still used, but uh, there are more sufficient uh, formats. For example, like SRT, which is uh, actually secure reliable transport. It's also based on IP UDP like RTP. So a very basic protocol, but implements uh, its own repetition mechanism. So if a packet is lost, it's detected. And then the, the client actually can say, hey, I've lost the so packet lost and please repeat it. And this is uh, actually adjustable so that you can uh, say, okay, you, you can have a more or less a low delay, then you can't rip, rip, uh, use the repetition too much, or you have a longer delay and then you can always repeat um, packets and then you can cope with more packet loss. And also it has uh, some end-to-end -end encryption with AES 128 and it has optional forward error correction. So normally the delay is around 120 milliseconds, but you can uh, adjust that um, yeah, depending on how much uh, packet loss you will want to cope with or how much delay should be. So, and then there is a successor uh, of SRG actually, it's called Reliable Internet Stream Protocol, RISRIST. Uh, it's based on RTP, not the pure UDP protocol, and it has some advanced retransmission requests via the control protocol of RTP. Yeah, it's, uh, it had more, has more features actually. It's not all, all listed here and it's more flexible. And the last but not least, there's the session initiated protocol for the contribution. And that's actually, you've seen before, more used in the case that a reporter reports to um, the studio. And actually it connects mostly two partners via a server and uses therefore for two RTP streams um, for the audio transmission. So now let's get uh, to the ICE, uh, distribution formats. And there we first have Icecast, which is actually HTTP based. So all like all your uh, web server websites you are getting, it's also HTTP. And it's actually split in, in two parts. The first one is that um, the distribution via LabShout goes to the CDN server and there is the Icecast server. And the other part is that it's going from the CDN server to the listener. 
and it has a delay between five and 30 seconds. But I heard that they actually want to reduce that to more or less two to five seconds so that it's more real time than it is at the moment. That has also something to do with coping with packet loss and so on. So normally the clients are um, having a, a big buffer to buffer this um, uh, the audio. So if a packet is lost, it can be retransmitted and then the stream is not it's not broken in the meantime. Then we have uh, Vibrate, which is actually invented by Nakama. It's also HTTP based, and it has some advantages in, in skip radio and advanced advertising. So uh, if you want to have an example for that, that's uh, Das Ding Radio by SWR. There's an app and that you can uh, actually download and you can hear, listen to the radio. And if you don't like the music in between, you can just skip it and skip to the next song. Then we have HLS distribution. I don't want to say too much about it because that's a part of the presentation of Bernd in the second part. So it's also HTTP based and it's first uh, specified by Apple. And uh, it's actually based on file segments. So um, it's, it's split up uh, the audio in, in segments or it's also used for video. And therefore that you have a delay like five seconds and up because normally files, the file segments are um, five seconds long, for example, but you can also adjust that. And then we have uh, MPEG Dash, Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. That was actually specified by the MPEG group and it's very similar to HLS. Uh, the problem with that is that it has good support by Google, so all in, in, in all Android telephones, but uh, no native support by Apple. So iOS and Mac actually do have no native support and therefore it's more complicated to get that in there. Uh, and we also found out that um, that it's quite hard to get redundant uh, transmission with uh, Dash. So if you want to have two encoders sending to two servers, the, it's very problematic to get that in sync. Okay, so for a reliable transmission, actually you want to use uh, double encoders. So um, you stream the the audio from the radio studio to two different encoders and then you stream it to two different entry points in the CDN and maybe you can also stream to both CDNs so that each uh, node has uh, all informations but you have and from there you go to the listener and the CDN has um, very complex mechanisms to be sure that the listener always gets the signal. Uh, you can have some synchronization issues here. So if the delay over one encoder is longer than over the other, then you have to sync it somehow in the CDN, or you have to live with some um, jumps in the audio signal if there's a switch between the CDNs or the, or the sources. So I want to give you now some uh, example scenarios. Um, one would be... Uh, to stream RTMP to HLS or use native HLS, but that's a part of uh, Bernd's presentation later. Uh, and one would be Icecast. So you have two encoders, which are actually streaming to two different entry points in CDN. And they sometimes um, sync the audio there and then stream it to the listener. And if one encoder actually fails, then the CDN switches to, to the other encoder and actually streams that to the listener. Another example would be D4B streaming. I've not said so much about it here, but actually it's also an encoder which encodes the audio signal to uh, MPEG TS stream, which is transported, for example, over RTP. And then it goes uh, through a longer network. And then at the end, you have a DVB switch that actually switches if one of the encoder fails and so you don't have any gaps in the signal when uh, your listeners receive it. Uh, sometimes you want to have a DVB switch in between at your side so that if you're for example doing an update on one encoder you can switch on your side um, the, the source so that you can update your encoder without any interruption. 
And sometimes the DBB switch on the end is a little bit not good, doing a so good job. So sometimes you want, don't want to <laughs> fail there. In the last webinar, uh, pod, podcast creation, and there are also some very uh, interesting reliability scenarios. So uh, maybe it's a nice thing to watch the last webinar uh, with Gernot Link from Deutschland Radio. And then on the net last part, I want to go into uh, how you can reliably do metadata insertion, for example. And in our extreme, it's that way that um, you actually update the metadata via a REST RP. And there you can, for example, detect if something fails. And so, for example, if you do not get any update for two minutes, then you can go fall back to metadata, for example, that only contains the station name, for example. And that's also a reliability measure. You also can do that, for example, with our system uh, with other audio stuff. So, for example, if you see that the, the source fails so that you're not getting any uh, audio from the studio anymore, that you can switch to a recording, so a file that's actually on the server, and then you can stream that, for example. Yeah, so that's uh, my part of the presentation. Yeah, thanks, uh, Thomas. I don't know if we um, already have some uh, question on the, in the chat. Did they ask a question about <laughs> Skip Radio besides Nakama's Vibrid? We actually had a talk with uh, Philip Schaft, uh, which is in the Icecast uh, Foundation. And <laughs> he's also there. Hi, Philip. <laughs> and he, he told me actually that there is uh, more plans to do stuff like that in, in the Icecast right now. So uh, I think we will see some stuff in, in a future version of the Icecast server that we can also have um, yeah, more contribution to that. So then uh, another question. Ah, yeah. And he also uh, wrote that they are already doing this with some plugs. <laughs> okay, nice. Uh, another question is, how are the field experiences using SRT for contribution? Um, so actually, for us, SRT is quite new. Actually, we uh, plan to add it in the next version. But as far from what I read, uh, SRT is a very good protocol, especially if you ha have some packet losses in your network. Um, if you do, do not have that, I would think that it's pretty similar to, to RTP contribution. But you also have the, the advantage of uh, encryption if you want to have that. So if you're going over an open network, it might so also be a good thing. Yeah. So. Um, if there are any more questions, I think we have some time left at the very end, so you can ask that also there. Yeah, um, we will do that at the end, uh, but please continue to write your, your question in the chat, uh, especially now we need you in the chat because it's time for our quiz. So you, uh, you have the chance to win a, a Fancast t-shirt. So here's a question of the day. Uh, what will be the number of the, um, of the next release of extreme software? So we started with probably uh, 1.0. Uh, we, re we just released two weeks ago the number. Mm -hmm -hmm. You can maybe uh, look uh, on your press release on our website. But now the question, the next, is, uh, the next one, what will be the number? So please put your answer in the chat. and. Uh, as a, all the right answer will, uh, will win a, a Fancast t-shirt. I'm going now to, uh, uh, to give the, the word to uh, Tobias Donbush, our product expert, who is going to, uh, to give you an extreme uh, demo with a focus on the, on the pipes and, and the streaming. Yes, uh, thank you, Virginie. Switch to my screen. You should be able to see it now, hopefully. Perfect. Yes, I'm going to give you a very, very uh, short summary of the uh, the pipe concept and also uh, things related to streaming. So mostly to the distribution side or the distribution to the CDN, I should say, just because uh, for Bernd's part, you should be aware of uh, at least the basics to understand what he shows to you. 
Um, those of you who have never seen this before, feel free to, of course, contact us about a, uh, a separate presentation so you get a perhaps better idea of exactly what the advantages of iStream are. With that out of the way, uh, let's take a quick look, shall we? So first, what you need to understand is in our software, we use what we call the pipe concept. The pipe concept is basically a very specific way how to um, both configure and display a, uh, a connection configuration, whether it's a, a contribution or a distribution connection. And it's called the pipe because the entire connection from the, the source, from the input to the uh, sync, that's the output, the destination, depending, is displayed as uh, this row of elements, which we call the pipe. So here you have some very simple examples, really. Um, with a uh, URL input, so a stream is taken from the internet that is already exists, uh, encoded in FLAC in this case, uh, so very high quality, basically lossless, and then uh, sent out via SRT as a simple example. Uh, here you have one example with IceCast stream instead, but I think this sort of um, gives you a basic idea of uh, how this is built. But to deepen this a little bit more, I'm going to show you how it would look if you create an, a whole new IceCast stream. So let's say, for example, you are in a larger network and you have an, let's say, a 67 input that you want to stream out. Uh, in our case, this would be an audio over IP input source in this case. Let's say you also want to have a volume control and a level meter on the, the dashboard, which we don't show today, but it's basically a way where you can see all this sort of system information, among other things. And uh, let's say you also want to use our proprietary loudness control to adjust it. Since this is an internet stream, you want to have uh, metadata insertion, which uh, Thomas also mentioned. So this is all these extra things that you can have in the pipe that we didn't see before. And uh, it's a fairly classic MP3 stream. And as we said, you want to stream it out IceCast. So with having all of these things clicked together, I could have also used drag and drop, by the way. I have the, the basic setup of the uh, pipe finished. And now I can do the detailed configuration by clicking on the respective elements. So for instance, if I click on audio RP, then I get the uh, AA67 configuration options like uh, picking the session. There's actually one available here, but we should not uh, play around with this right now. Or I could just uh, copy paste in the SDP, depending on what works better for my uh, network. And obviously all these things can also be configured. Just as a quick example, if I go on metadata inserter, then Obviously, I can define the input, as uh, Thomas mentioned, for the uh, metadata updating. Uh, in this case, probably would uh, set it as an HTTP. Also, don't have quite enough time to go into any detail here, but you may be able to already tell here all the tags that you may be familiar with, ID3 tags. But normally, of course, you would update these via HTTP. In MP3, of course, well, you can adjust the bit rate and uh, codec specific options, obviously. And in the IceCast, in this case, set the destination port, etc., etc. And once everything is uh, set up, you save it, and then you can start, stop, and pause the connection from here. And of course, later adjust it. I think that gives you a basic idea of how uh, this looks in, in practice, not just for streaming, but also in general. And now to round this out, I'm going to give you a quick look at uh, groups, which are going to be especially relevant for HLS here in a moment. So we also have this uh, groups tab here. And we have already one prepared. This is, in fact, uh, one that, is, uh, that Dan is going to show you in a moment. And uh, groups, pipe groups, basically serve two separate actually more really, um, functions. So for one thing, it's simply a way to group up uh, multiple pipes so you can control them at the same time. That's sort of the, the default use, let's say. But you can also configure pipes for very specific um, yeah, applications, let's say. For instance, this is how you create a uh, DDB multiplex in our system. So if you have multiple individual streams, you can use these groups to well, group them into a uh, DB multiplex that you then send out via MPEG-TS, for example. And uh, as you can see here, there's uh, 
quite a variety of others available. Specifically for us, of course, is interesting the HLS dash here. Why is this interesting? Because um, the one special aspect of HLS compared to IceCast for streaming is that uh, you have all these different quality levels, like we see your AC at 128 and 64 and so on, and they can be bundled basically. And uh, in our system, you can simply group them together like this. This is the same input signal, but some uh, different bit rates chosen. And uh, then you select one of these pipes to be the master that handles all the streaming for the entire and segmenting, of course, of the entire HLS stream. And of course, you could have an arbitrary number of additional streams here, different qualities, or um, even some other changes, depending. Yeah, and that shall be it for now. As I said, if you uh, are interested in seeing more or more in depth or even play around with it yourself, please do not hesitate to contact us and we can schedule a presentation or give you access to our online demo. And uh, with that, I would hand over straight to Bernd. I'm just hooking in directly here. So this is a focus on HLS um, with actually emphasis on reliable transmission. Uh, we chose this topic because uh, the measures that we take for reliability in HLS are implemented in the encoder. So that's uh, that's our business and then, and then where we put our effort. And that's why we chose to show that a little bit. Uh, many of you should be familiar with HLS, I suppose, but uh, maybe not so many have looked into the details. So uh, we, I, I'll try to show a little bit how the redundancy and failover mechanisms work internally. Okay. So um, the content is uh, just an overview to get an idea of HLS. Thomas told already a little bit, uh, then the redundancy mechanisms, and uh, then going on to the example. HLS has its origin in the company Apple, but it has been opened and, and standardized with IETF as an RFC. It's a file-based distribution protocol. The idea is that everywhere, and that's, that's usually if you have internet, you have HTTP, and then you can use HLS, and that's uh, one of the main advantages. There are different flavors of HLS. Uh, of course, it's, it's mainly used for video, but we uh, as a company do audio and you have a flavor for on-demand and you have something for live streaming. And uh, an important aspect is that you have a support for different so-called renditions and rendition can mean different things that can be different quality levels, uh, different languages, or um, uh, it can be uh, a version with subtitle with or without video or whatever. Um, and one aspect is the redundancy. So there is a rendition for a primary stream and a backup stream, okay? And that's our focus here. Uh, for HLS, you require, because it's a file-based protocol, you require files, uh, segmented audio. So classically, it's uh, segments in an MPEG, MPEG transport stream, uh, which many people still use. Uh, more modern is this CMAF format, as it's called, it's MP4. Uh, there you have some, uh, common initialization for the segments that reduces the bitrate in an init file. And then you have segments which are called, for example, M4S, so MP4 segment. Uh, it's a fragmented MP4 for MP4 format. Okay, um, then besides the audio segments, you have a master playlist. Uh, this is only uploaded once on StreamStart. Uh, it's not changed anymore usually. Uh, and it points to the individual renditions and the rendition playlist themselves, then point to the segments and they are periodically updated. So here's an example. Um, on the top, you will see uh, the, such a, an example of a master playlist for 160 kilobit, for example, and it points to a segment list. And the same for a backup. So you see this with this little test minus B. Uh, so that's the second rendition for the backup stream in 160 kilobit. Um, and here you have the same for it, the 64. And on the lower end, you have the example for a rendition playlist where you, um, the, the init segment and the MP4 fragments are just listed in a row and they're supposed to be played in that row. Uh, an important aspect is this media sequence ID, which um, more or less identifies the version of this playlist. And uh, it's an important aspect that this version needs to be in sync with primary and backup stream. Okay, I'll come to redundancy in HLS. So one way is um, redundant HLS that the encoder does classical uh, streaming to the CDN with RTMP. 
and the uh, CDN has the task of generating this uh, rendition and master playlist, so it provides the HLS, um, so the CDN is a centralized instance, we have no synchronization issue, and uh, yeah, the CDN takes it over, um, but you have do not have really a good freedom on the encoder side to configure your HLS, and you cannot use um, all features, so only those configurable by the CDN, and that's usually limited. So what uh, our customers are using and what we are providing is an encoder side redundancy where we have two encoders uh, that, which are supplied uh, with audio from the radio studio uh, and they directly uh, produce HLS, uh, which is then put up to a CDN or two CDN entry points and then that goes to the listener. Uh, one requirement here is that we need synchronized operation between these encoders, but as those might reside at different sites of the radio station, um, that's not always uh, provided, so um, we have to work around that. And the question is how if one encoder fails or is, is shut down temporarily, how the failover is triggered. Um, well, the, the listener site uh, has uh, usually a smartphone app which detects that uh, the current rendition playlist is not accessible anymore or is not updated anymore and then uh, the, the listener app can switch to the um, backup it knows about the backup because it's listed in the master stream okay um so here's how we provide um synchronization and there's a primary encoder running uh, and providing segments in a row and uh, let's assume the backend encoder received an update. It's, it's uh, booting up. And at some point, you want to start the backup encoder. Well, synchronization, it's the usual idea we follow is that we have a time synchronization between the two servers and have a global real-time based time grid. So the first segment uh, is cropped early. And then these these borders here are known at both encoders and so they can provide some uh, segments which are in sync okay um the syncing of the rendition playlists is part of the short demo i will be giving afterwards okay the support in our software extreme is given in a form that um yeah well uh, there's a requirement that primary backup configuration obviously has to be in sync and we want to make that as easy as possible so you have to configure your hls in one place you can export that config import into the other encoder and select the role of this encoder as a backup so that's just one click i will show it to you and then uh, because you're not dependent on the cdn anymore you can use um, a lot of playlist features which maybe the cdn does not provide by itself okay and um, now on for the demo i'm uh, logging into the system um which tobias has shown you there's uh, hls stream set being set up i'm doing the backup now on the same machine because we see it on one screen then so uh, i push this button and clone this group so i have a second hls now which i might uh, label hls okay uh, let's back up and I, all I have to do with a clone configuration is to tick this one use backup configuration and save and we're good now I'm going to start the primary encoder and we are going to see what uh, it will be doing I'm not seeing it okay I'm doing it this way Okay, so this is the master playlist that has been produced. So all the streams in two bit rates and each with primary, so that's demo and backup, demo minus B are announced. So they are known from now on to the listener. And uh, we can see how the um, segment playlists proceed. Uh, so they uh, it is supposed to contain 10 segments and that should be more or less filled by now. Just wait a little bit. And with each segment uh, that is that is added here and one removed here, this media sequence counter increases. So that's how uh, the, the versioning is kept track of. Now let's look at the backup. There's this one. It's uh, 404 not found because it's not running. So let's get started with the backup stream. And what you will see now that there is a backup playlist. 
And you see, uh, which is important, that the media sequence ID is ahead. So this is at 38, and this is at 44, and it's kept at 44. Um, and this is the main trick. So this is ahead in time, so that uh, one uh, the, uh, the listener sees here. Okay, when I'm uh, both are at 44, uh, we are totally in sync, and you will see that when this has been uh, filled up with 10 segments. So this one also reaches the 44. Okay. Then also the right one begins to increase. So now we are fully in sync. Both playlists contain 10 segments and both encoders run in sync. Yeah, and we can do uh, failovers. Yes, so for the failover, I'm switching um, player. Here. Okay, um, let me clear this. Is it playing? Yeah. Okay. So now we here see that we receive a stream from this this very stream in, in, in a web player for HLS. And uh, we see here, I hope you can read the tooltip that uh, the segment lists are read from the primary encoder. So it says HTTP something, fancast, and then demo without the minus B. Okay, so now uh, what happens if I stop the primary? So that means it's crashed, hopefully not, but, but maybe it receives an update or the network is gone or something. We should see how the player reacts. Okay, it's here, it tries to read the list, but receives a 404 code, so it's not available. And immediately it, okay, I'll stop it here because everything is there. It switches to the backup, okay? And from the backup, it fetches the segment with, with the 68 at the end. And you see the segment previously loaded was the 67. So that's a flawless handover uh, to the backup stream. And uh, once the, for example, the, the, the update has been uh, Carry it out on on this uh, primary encoder. I can start it again, and I've shown you how that works. So it, it is catching up to the backup, and at some point they are completely in sync. So with filled up playlists, yeah. So that's more or less what I wanted to show you. Yeah, uh, takeaways of course from what you've seen with the player that that this seamlessly works and and. Um, I hope I could give you a little bit of insight into how the HLS failover actually works um, under the hood, uh, because maybe not all of you were aware of this. Okay, um, so I thank you very much for your attention. And yes, maybe we can start with some questions or postpone them to the end of our webinar. Um, I'm not sure how to. Here. Yeah, maybe you you could have a look. Ben, there is. A... Yeah, okay. There are there are already awesome questions. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Cool stuff. Yes. <laughs> HLS encoding. Yeah. So HLS, uh, of course, it's not low latency, and it will usually not be because it's segmented. Um. So as long as you really have to upload file segments, you will have at least the latency of one segment length, which can be. Uh, um, at least three seconds, I would say. There are variants of low latency HLS. Do not really work with real segments, but but with uh, byte addressed streams, uh, which make the failover even harder. So it also has disadvantages. At the moment, we are not supporting them, but but we're open for discussions there. If if there is need to really have a lower delay uh, there is uh, something available in HLS standard, yes. Uh, how common is it for distribution of audio? Yes, uh, interesting question. For audio, I say, um, you know the Icecast and say, okay, well, why not? Icecast is working, it's an it's it's established standard. It does some changes on top of HTTP, that, that's one thing. And uh, yeah, it's, it's common for for uh, let's say public web streams so 
uh, which is accessible from the browser. They, they are the stations use um, Icecast, which is totally fine. As soon as they move on to their um, proprietary smartphone app, they are internally using HLS uh, because they can use more easily use other features like like in inserting uh, some announcement or ads or whatever the standard provides. Uh, so that's at least from my experience where um, the border is. So so public streams which are available are usually icecast um, in in the in the smartphone apps um, stations use HLS. And one advantage is that you can use time shifting with HLS. Yes, of course, and you have the time shifting because when the, when the playlist is two hours long, you can go back to two hours. Yeah. Basically, yeah. And thanks, Ben. Thanks, Thomas, and uh, thanks, Tobias, for your expert presentation and uh, and demo. That led. Would you like to present now the new developments in planning? Sure. Thanks, Virginie. And I also would, of course, like to encourage um, all participants to give their hint about the next uh, extreme release number. It will be the first time, actually, that we. Do not are not able to send our um, nice um, t-shirts, polos, the textile. I mean, I don't know which color is available, but I mean, it's. Um, I, I like to wear it, so it's. Uh, I'm very proud to have it. So um, just to give a hint um, here in the in the in the chat. And my last hint is um, it's between 1.5 and 8.5. So. Uh, that's maybe some uh, hint. So what's new? Yeah, we are beside really working uh, continuously on the extension of the extreme software feature set, which is very much driven by customers and projects. And even at the moment, we have uh, quite some um, interesting topics here. We have um, three um, different developments, um, which we are encouraged to, to follow up and do. There is Fairlife, which is a browser app uh, based application. I think you will hear something during 2022. Uh, we are also busy with services of Extreme from the uh, cloud uh, to uh, offer this to customers. And I think there's one news um, which you can probably watch during the next week. It's called Extreme Compact. And so if you are getting our newsletter. If not, please subscribe. And uh, if you follow uh, Red Tech or Pro Audio or Radio World and all those, I'm quite sure that you will see some interesting news uh, next week about uh, about Extreme Compact. Uh, can't say uh, much more about this for the moment. So I hope uh, it um, motivates you to uh, maybe subscribe to the newsletter or watch the news. So I think that's a, a continuous development on our side. And it's a very exciting phase. So the first three years of Fancast were extremely exciting and looking to all the requirements we get from customers and projects. Um, yeah, it keeps us, I think, to uh, develop things in high quality and, and serve, serve your needs. Back to Virginie then. Yeah, thanks. So thanks, Detlef. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Uh, before we leave, so we can have a last look at the at the quiz but yeah unfortunately uh, we didn't get the right answer maybe our expert thomas and bern could tell us what what is the what is the right answer do you know <laughs> <laughs> so i think so <laughs> yes actually we're um right before uh, uh right before a, a, a major step so the next version would be the three yeah, so it was a bit of uh, there was a bit of trick because it it, it should have been two point six, but it will be a big step with the next one. So yeah, maybe uh, it was a, a, a difficult one. I would like to uh, to say thank you again. I wish you all a nice day. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your attention. We are still in the room until eleven. If uh, you still have some question to put in the chat. We, we are available to answer. And for the one who has to continue their day, then goodbye. And uh, hopefully see you in our next uh, webinar.